Hey, welcome. My name is Daryl Press. I'm a professor in the government department here at Dartmouth, and I'm also coordinator of the War and Peace Studies program at the Dickey Center. It's my really great pleasure today to welcome to Dartmouth Professor Scott Sagan um, to give a talk as the third part in our three-part series on nuclear proliferation and nuclear deterrence in the 21st century. Uh, frankly, this is one of the most, I, I think, exciting times to be thinking about nuclear weapons and the future of nuclear weapons in many, many years. There's a great deal of ferment going on. Um, and for the first time in a great deal of time, people are thinking very seriously about changing the ways that we prioritize um, different goals in our nuclear arsenal. People are talking seriously about elevating um, the priorities of counter and non-proliferation and the priorities of preventing terrorism relative to the priorities of deterrence. And this has been reflected in the, new, in the administration's new uh, nuclear posture review. It's been reflected in the current discussions underway about the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, it's going to be um, front and center in, in a debate that might happen in the U.S. Senate in the coming months about possible ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, you know, these issues came up in the, brand, in the new uh, uh, nuclear weapons treaty the United States just signed with Russia. So these issues are really important issues right now, and they're issues that are getting a lot of attention in Washington. Um, we're very fortunate today to have with us Professor Scott Sagan, who is the Caroline S.G. Munro Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. But uh, Professor Sagan is the author of numerous books and articles on basically every topic related to nuclear weapons, nuclear strategy, and nuclear deterrence. He's written about nuclear strategy during the Cold War, about organization theory, and about what that reveals about the challenges of deterrence and also the challenges of maintaining safe and secure nuclear arsenals. He's written about how reliable nuclear deterrence is or is not, about what to do about Iran's apparent interest in nuclear weapons, and about why countries seek nuclear weapons in the first place. Um, Professor Sagan is also the co-director of an institute called CSAC at Stanford University, which is really an um, incredibly valuable national asset, which is um, one of the, I was going to say one of the few places, but today it's really maybe the only place or the paramount place that brings together physical scientists, engineers, and social scientists in the same institute to study and work on and do research on um, important national security issues. And beyond that, to also train and give support to young PhD students. It was, um, I guess, Please about Darryl. yeah, about 15 years ago, um, I profited enormously in terms of time and mentoring and support by being a, a fellow at Scott Center. So Scott is, um, is a leading scholar. Uh, in this field and really one of the world's true experts on all things related to nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. And uh, please join me in welcoming him to Dartmouth. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Can everyone hear me in the back? Yes. Okay, good. Um, concerns about climate change and global warming, the volatility of oil prices, and energy security have led many countries in the world to have a new, renewed interest in nuclear power. Some 30 countries now have nuclear power plants up and operating. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which I'll refer to throughout this talk, uh, some 50 countries have gone to the IAEA and ask them for assistance in creating nuclear power plants in their countries. Can we have a spread of nuclear power, which many people are interested in for climate change purposes, without having an increase in the risk of new countries getting nuclear weapons, or terrorists using nuclear power plants for terrorist purposes? to get nuclear materials or to sabotage them to create terrorist incidents. That's the challenge we face. Can we have more nuclear power without security problems being attached to it? And my answer today is a very simple one. It depends. <laughs> it depends on which of the new aspirant nuclear wannabes get nuclear power plants. It depends critically on the international control of the fuel that goes into the power plants, the enriched uranium for light water reactors, or plutonium in MOX fuel for other reactors, and the plutonium 
that comes out that is in the spent fuel rods of nuclear power plants. Because both of those, fuel going in and the material coming out of a nuclear power plant, can also be used for a nuclear weapon. And it depends, finally, critically on the shared responsibilities that could be accepted between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states for how to manage in what is the current and future challenge of creating new arms control regimes that manage not just weaponry, but manage nuclear power and the fuel that is needed for any kind of nuclear power plant. The first slide I have here, which you'll see, again, illustrates this problem. Can anyone guess where this nuclear power plant is or what, why it's important? Where? No, this is actually not local. This is the Baba Atomic Research Center in India, in India. correct. This is the Kandu reactor uh, that the United States and Canada sold to them uh, as part of a peaceful nuclear uh, program under the Adams for Peace program and the Indians against the rules that had governed that used that to get the plutonium for their first nuclear weapons test, the so-called peaceful nuclear explosive that they detonated in 1974. So what I'll do today is talk first about the history of who has nuclear weapons, who's tried to get nuclear weapons, and then stopped their nuclear weapons programs, who has nuclear power, and who is trying to get nuclear power, and try to think about what are the technical and political characteristics of these states. Second, I'll talk about the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, which is just starting yesterday under a major review conference in, in, at the UN. Uh, I'll be there on Thursday and Friday uh, meeting with some of the, the delegates, talking about these issues. What, how does the NPT work? And what can we do to strengthen it to reduce some of the security risks that could come if nuclear power is used more widely in the world? What can we do about the risks of terrorism? When the NPT was designed, terrorism was not one of the major issues. And as <coughs> Professor Press has just suggested, many people, myself included, think that this is a new dimension, one that has that existed in the past but is far more serious today and needs, therefore, to be addressed much more seriously. In lieu of conclusions, I'll talk uh, a bit about the major policy, policy initiative and how the Obama administration is thinking about this in a grand experiment to try to use reductions in U.S. nuclear weapons in our disarmament commitments to try to use that as a way of trying to encourage more countries to accept restraints themselves. If we accept restraints, trying to encourage other countries to accept reciprocal or additional restraints. So first, this is well known. It is a chart of countries that have nuclear weapons, done by time, and then the total number of countries. Every five years or so throughout the nuclear age, another country has gotten nuclear weapons from the U.S. to the Soviet Union in 1949, Britain, France, China, Israel, India, South Africa, Pakistan. The blip up comes from the end of the Soviet Union in which Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus inherited the weapons that they had on their soil, never got full command and control over those weapons, but then through some rather adroit diplomacy during the Clinton administration, uh, were convinced to send them back to Russia. South Africa, which had gotten the bomb during the apartheid regime, just before the apartheid regime fell, voluntarily gave up their weapons, invited the IAEA, the international inspectors, to come in to ensure that they had done that, and keeps the highly enriched uranium that they used for their secret weapons program uh, still today in the Pelindaba research facility in South Africa. Belarus, Kazakhstan, Ukraine got rid of them, and then North Korea was the most recent case of a country that had been a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, withdrew from the treaty, and tested uh, now two weapons. One not very successfully, the other with at least uh, a modicum 
uh, of success. That's well known. This next chart is not well known at all. This shows the close calls. The number of countries that had nuclear weapons programs and then gave them up over time. The evidence to support this is in some of my research and also in the work, the quantitative, the statistical database developed by uh, Chris Way at Cornell University. And what you see here in this roller coaster are a number of countries that began to explore developing nuclear weapons and then decided to stop that program. There's no single causal variable that explains all of these renunciation or these nuclear reversal decisions. You have some cases of countries that were pressured by the United States and were alliance partners and we told them that their security relationship with us was jeopardized and we wanted to reassure them that we would use our nuclear weapons if they were ever attacked by another country with nuclear weapons that we'd respond and they don't need nuclear weapons and their programs therefore were neither necessary and were dangerous from our perspective and could reduce our alliance commitment to them. Think about South Korea or Taiwan in those particular cases. Other countries were nuclear disarmed by force. Iraq in 1991 and then through the UN inspections in the mid-1990s got rid of their nuclear program. We now know had not been restarted before the 2003 uh, Gulf War, but they had one in 1991 and they were stopped by the ceasefire and then the UN inspections uh, afterwards. Other countries like South Africa voluntarily gave, gave up the bomb and many other countries started programs and as you'll see when we describe the Non-Proliferation Treaty, decided that they'd be better off with an agreement not to seek and not to acquire nuclear weapons if others throughout the world also agreed in a reciprocal and verifiable manner by having inspection systems that they wouldn't get nuclear weapons as well. And so the NPT is a crucial part of the explanation about why countries have given up and moreover why countries that gave them up stayed with, stayed the course. What you do find, however, are there's some cheaters. And the IAEA has caught some cheaters. Iran most recently, North Korea before that. And that is actually another valuable part of this regime, to find people who violate it and to be able to have some kind of inspection system that needs to be improved and I'll talk about how it could be improved. So this is, I think, uh, a largely hidden history. Some has been written about it but we have far less in-depth understanding because this kind of work is often kept secret. Countries don't like to admit that they violated agreements that they made and even some loyal countries who started programs don't always want to acknowledge all the details about what they did in the past. But this is our best reconstruction from a scholarly perspective. So now let's look forward at nuclear power. Here you have in black the list of all the countries that today have nuclear power plants. The United States, France, Russia being among the leaders in terms of the number and the use of nuclear power, uh, China and India being the two most rapid growth countries in terms of existing nuclear power plants and building more of them all the time. But the red countries are all the countries who have asked the International Atomic Energy Agency, as they have a right to do under the treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, for assistance in building nuclear power plants. Not all of them are committed to do so, but many of them, all of them are exploring the option and many of them have started putting large resources into it. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, for example, has just signed a six to seven billion dollar agreement with the South Koreans to build their first uh, nuclear power plant. What can you say about the red countries compared to the existing? Well, first look geographically. 
much wider spread of countries in the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, while existing states with nuclear power are largely in the industrialized West, with the exceptions of India, Pakistan, and three states in, in, in Asia and one in the Middle East and Africa. The average economic status of the aspiring states is lower. It's not surprising that given $6 billion to build a facility, that richer countries have tended to go first, more advanced countries. But more important than anything about the economics or the geographical spread, the most important thing to take into account is the political diversity. And so what I've done to try to understand that as a political scientist is to take what are valuable um, indices that could influence the security implications of nuclear power and have compared the average scores of the aspirant states, those ones in red, to the existing states represented in blue here on a number of different indices of political import. These are not indices that I've developed. They were independently developed by others for other purposes, so there's some objectivity here. But the first is corruption. The World Bank keeps a record, a measure of corruption in all countries around the world. Take their measures and look at the aspiring states who have much lower, on average, records of control of corruption. And this is important because when we think about the spread of nuclear weapons, materials being sold out of a power plant, of an insider having a tie to a terrorist organization, the degree of corruption in a system is one of the important things that you'd want to measure and want to assess in terms of whether a country is a safe keeper or a, a responsible holder of nuclear power. Political stability, another World Bank measure used for World Bank purposes to try to assess the likelihood that a country would be, a go government would be destabilized by political violence at home. The existing nuclear power states are higher than the aspiring states. Government effectiveness, the ability of the government to do what it says it wants to do. Aspiring states are lower. Regulatory quality, the ability of the government to regulate operations throughout their industrial sphere appropriately. You want to have, for safety and security reasons, strong regulatory agencies. Again, aspiring states are lower on average. And the last score is what political scientists uh, call the Polity 4 database, which are measures of how democratic versus autocratic countries are. And you'll see that countries with um, nuclear power today, with some notable exceptions, Pakistan, uh, China being the most extreme, have pretty high ratings on the democracy score. Aspiring states, on average, are much lower, and the range is from very low to, to, to high on the, on the new aspiring nuclear power states. So this is one measure writ large of the challenge that we face for global warming purposes, many countries are interested in getting nuclear power and many climate change specialists hope because that will at least help a bit on the global climate change issue. For energy security, many of these countries want nuclear power. But from a global security perspective, we have a real challenge in front of us. What can we do well, one thing to do is not to give them nuclear power, but that's not always our choice. The other thing we can do is try to raise these qualities, and people are interested in doing that. The other thing we can do is think about the international institutions that manage the control of nuclear weapons and nuclear power, and especially nuclear fuel, and try to use the NPT regime, the Non-Proliferation Treaty regime, and the other 
institutions that have been built over the years around that treaty to try to better manage the process if there is going to be a spread to make it done in a more safe and secure manner. Oh, here is actually another set of the challenges on the terrorism side. I originally thought if you used the average number of terrorist incidents in countries that you'd also see the black current states having fewer terrorist incidents than the aspiring states. Turns out actually not to be true on average, but that's because India and Pakistan uh, swamped the database because they have so many terrorist incidents on their soil. But here using that same criteria of red being the new countries, aspiring nuclear power states, you'll see that incidents of terrorism in the past five years according to the U.S. government's National Counterterrorism, Counterterrorism Center um, that the aspiring states today would have uh, six of the top ten countries in terms of terrorist incidents. Again, we have a real challenge trying to expand nuclear power use around the world given these political realities. So what can be done? Well, the NPT, the Nonproliferation Treaty, signed and created in 1968, ratified and coming into force in 1970 and expanding in terms of its membership since then, today has some 187 member countries. Virtually every country in the world, from the Vatican uh, and Monaco and small microstates to the largest states, India is not a member, Israel is not a member, Pakistan is not a member, and North Korea has withdrawn. Those are the only four states in the world that are not members of this treaty. How does it work? What are the bargains in it? What are its pillars that hold up the spread? Because as you saw before, there are a number of nuclear weapon states, but not nearly as many as tried to get nuclear weapons, and not nearly as many as could get nuclear weapons if we didn't have this treaty. How does it work? Like any international treaty that has multiple parts, different countries value different parts of the treaty somewhat differently. But in my view, there are five major pillars holding up this regime, and each of these pillars, unfortunately, has been cracked in recent years. And that's what they're debating at the NPT Review Conference in New York this week, what to do about some of the problems with the treaty. Five articles I'll refer to. The first is Article 1. During the Cold War when the Russians, Amer Soviets, Americans, uh, the British first joined the treaty, the French and the Chinese did not uh, agree to join this treaty later, until later, each nuclear weapon state party, the part, states that have nuclear weapons in 1968, agreed that they would not transfer nuclear uh, weapons or other nuclear explosives or assist, encourage, or induce any non-nuclear weapon state to manufacture nuclear weapons. This was, in political science or economic jargon, a solution to a collective action problem. The United States might have wanted to give nuclear weapons to its allies, the Soviets to its allies, but we'd both be worse off. So we agreed that neither country will help its allies get nuclear weapons. That has been cracked in recent years because many people, especially in the non-nuclear weapon states, think that the United States' decision to sign an agreement with India which has not signed the treaty and previously by all other administrations until the last administration uh, was determined to be an outlier, to be a, a, a state that hasn't followed the non-proliferation treaty, refused to sign it, developed nuclear weapons, so we're not going to help them with nuclear power. We made a reversal in the U.S.-India deal and said that we will help you with nuclear power, we will sell you nuclear fuel if you want it, and the non-nuclear weapon states have said, and the members of the treaty have said, wait a second, they can use that nuclear fuel for their reactors and their indigenous nuclear fuel they can now use to build more bombs. So they say that that treaty 
part has been cracked. That, 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 that pillar has been cracked. The second article says that each non-nuclear weapon state party in the treaty undertakes not to receive, transfer whatsoever, uh, any transfer or whatsoever of nuclear weapons and other nuclear explosive devices and not to manufacture or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons. That is a solution to another kind of collective action problem for the non-nuclear weapon states. As you saw before, many non-nuclear weapon states were interested in getting nuclear weapons and decided not to do so. And part of the reason, not the only reason, but for many of them, part of the reason was a sense that you know, if I get nuclear weapons, my neighbors are going to get nuclear weapons and we'll both be worse off. So what if I sign this treaty, my neighbors sign the treaty, we have the International Atomic Energy Inspectors come, they can verify that the nuclear power in the other countries is not being siphoned off for nuclear weapons, won't we all be better off? That part of the treaty has been cracked by the decisions of North Korea to withdraw, which creates threats to Japan and South Korea, and by the Iranian covert nuclear weapons program under the guise of a nuclear power program, which has now begun to be perceived as a threat by many other countries in the Middle East. So what can we do about this part of the treaty which is weakened? Article 4. Article 4 says that nothing in this treaty will interfere with the inalienable right of all parties to the treaty to develop research, production, and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. The states agree not to develop nuclear weapons, said we want, as part of the benefit, we want to benefit from nuclear power, and the language chosen by the uh, treaty drafters has a uh, 18th century feel to it, a, a, a natural rights declaration of independence feel, the inalienable right to nuclear power. Um, uh, the the uh, mathematician strategist Albert Wallstetter once quipped that, that it's as if people think they have a right to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of plutonium. <laughs> but it's worth noting, I'll make this point later as well, that the treaty also says inalienable right here, but it says in conformity with Articles 1 and 2 of the treaty. So it's not really an inalienable right. It's a conditional right dependent on you being not trying to acquire nuclear weapons. And if the International Atomic Energy Agency cannot confirm that you are in conformity with this part of the treaty, you have at least temporarily sacrificed your so-called inalienable right, something that uh, Mr. Ahmadinejad did not mention in his speech yesterday in front of the United Nations. What are the other cracked pillars? Well, so, so that pillar is cracked because you have a country that is a member of the treaty, claims to be building uranium enrichment for uh, peaceful purposes, didn't tell the IAEA that it was doing that, which is against its agreement, and has been caught by IAEA inspectors with a number of other experiments that are weapons related, not power related. Article 6. This is the so-called disarmament clause in the treaty. The United States and the Soviet Union originally said we don't want to have a nuclear uh, disarmament as part of the treaty and the non-nuclear weapons states insisted that you must. They wanted very specific language, specific commitments, and the compromise was that all parties agreed to work in good faith, negotiations in good faith on effective measures and to nuclear disarmament. And many non-nuclear weapon states, until very recently, have said the nuclear weapon states haven't done enough. You said you were going to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, you didn't do it. You said you were going to have major arms reductions, you haven't done enough. And lastly, there's, it's not really a loophole, it's something that exists in all international treaties, a, tr a right of withdrawal if you give three months notice in advance of supreme national interests. As in all international treaties, countries maintain the sovereign right to withdraw if they feel it's necessary. And North Korea's decision to withdraw 
has made this a real problem because people recognize that there's a problem. What if you develop nuclear power as a member of the treaty, you have the nuclear fuel now that can be used for a bomb, you withdraw from the treaty, you've, through legal means, suddenly developed a nuclear bomb capability, and that's what North Korea did. So what can be done? Well, this is my late colleague Wolfgang Panofsky and President Obama's statements about the basic bargain. And what I would like to point out is that this is truly part of the bargain, but there are a number of other bargains, and we need to look very closely at the language of the treaty to understand how the treaty could be improved. So point one, Article 4 and Article 6 are linked and both apply to the nuclear weapon states, the NWS, and the non-nuclear weapon states. I apologize for all the acronyms. This business, uh, for, for sake of, of brevity, uses way too many acronyms. And if any of them aren't clear, please raise your hand and I'll try to uh, always explain them. Um, Article 4, as I noted, says it's an inalienable right, but it's really conditional. The nuclear weapon states could do a lot more to show that nuclear weapon states should have safeguards, that is, have inspections on their soil. Under the current system, the non-nuclear weapon states complain, saying, we at nuclear power, we have inspectors to make sure we're not cheating. You don't contribute enough to the safeguards budget for the IAEA, and you don't have safeguards on your soil because no one's concerned about whether we're using our nuclear power plants to get materials for weapons, because we have dedicated weapons already. They know that. So one thing that we could do that would help would be on some of our new facilities to have model safeguard programs. To say, we're going to, for the sake of, of equality, for the sake of modeling best practices, to help you understand how better to monitor and safeguard facilities, we're going to do that. So for example, we are building a new uranium enrichment facility for nuclear power in Idaho today, and at least the tentative decision is to have the IAEA come in to inspect it. Not to make sure we're not cheating, but to show good faith and to model better practices, to have better techniques. All states contribute more to the safeguard budget. We shouldn't, as often happens, say a country wants nuclear power, they have to pay the IAEA for the inspections. This is a global good, it's a shared responsibility. We all should contribute, and I was really pleased that Secretary Clinton announced a major contribution that the United States is going to make in her speech in front of the UN yesterday. A really very wise investment in the future of nuclear safeguards that can help make nuclear power be done in a more proliferation managed way. Article 6 says we should pursue disarmament in good faith. If you read that closely, so it doesn't say that the nuclear weapon states have to work in good faith. It says all members of the treaty have to work in good faith towards eventual disarmament. The non-nuclear weapon states have by and large simply complained. You're not doing enough for nuclear disarmament. And my argument, which I'll be making in New York, and which uh, has now been responded to by a number of non-nuclear weapon states uh, leading authorities notes that the nuclear weapon states on the road to getting to nuclear disarmament will find it harder and harder to disarm once they get to low numbers if there are a lot of uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing facilities around the world like the one that Iran's building. Because if they have that independent capability to enrich uranium for a power plant, they just need to spin the centrifuges for a longer period of time and they can turn that low enriched uranium into high enriched uranium for a bomb or take the plutonium out of their plants, reprocess it to recycle it for MOX fuel for reactors, but they could, could keep reprocessing and use the plutonium for bombs. So we need to have international control as a long-term goal. And the non-nuclear websites, many of them, say we're not interested in that. We want to create our own fuel capabilities. And I argue that you should at least enter into negotiations about how to have international control. And it's not just in your interest 
It's an obligation under your Article 6 commitments. Don't just complain about the nuclear weapon states not doing enough. Keep urging them to do more, but the non-nuclear weapon states should pursue negotiations in good faith on international control of plutonium and reprocessing to have all plants that make enriched uranium or reprocessed plutonium to be under international control so that no one state could grab the material if it quit the treaty and make bombs out of it, or at least make it much harder for that to happen. And lastly, Article 6 and Article 10. Article 10 is the withdrawal clause. Very hard to have complete disarmament, which the President and other nuclear weapon states have said is our long-term goal, if other countries withdraw. So you could have reforms of the withdrawal clause. You could have a return to sender clause that said that any country that wants nuclear power, if they later follow their Article 10 rights to withdraw, has to return the materials that they got when they were a member of the treaty, the nuclear fuel, has to return it to their point of origin. You could have special IAEA safeguard agreements called the 66 type agreements that mean that even if you withdraw from the treaty, you have to have international inspectors on all your facilities. We could lengthen the fuse by changing the 90-day rule by a consensus vote to 365 days at the NPT Review Conference this month. Or we could have a system where there's automatic United Nations Security Council referral if the IAEA rules that the country's not in compliance with its treaty obligations. I personally am not optimistic that the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference will approve of any of these. Many countries would like to see this. A handful of countries, notably Iran, Brazil, uh, Egypt, do not. And the NPT Review Conference, with 187 countries having a right, is done by consensus. So I think the best we can hope for is that there will be a large-scale agreement to do these kinds of things, and a number of countries will vote no, and we'll at least see who does not want to reform the system. And the other countries will have to act accordingly, and one way that they can do that is through another organization called the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which is basically a cartel. It's all the countries that sell nuclear facilities and nuclear fuel for nuclear power, they could decide unilaterally that we're not going to sell to anybody unless they agree to those kinds of reforms. They could agree that we're not going to sell nuclear materials or nuclear power plants to countries unless they agree to what's called the additional protocol of the IAEA to have better inspections on spot inspections on demand anywhere in your country. So one thing that the Nuclear Suppliers Group is being urged to do, not just by me, but by many others, including former IAEA officials, and now, last September, by the UN Security Council, is as a condition of nuclear exports to require the return of nuclear materials. So these ideas about having a return to sender clause and have any special nuclear material produced while a country is a member of the treaty if it's voted to be non compliance, it has to legally return. Now, that doesn't mean they will do so, but it would mean that if they didn't, it would be illegal. They would have broken a law, and the likelihood of some kind of enforcement would be higher. Okay, so let me briefly uh, turn to nuclear terrorism, because that's the other new issue. And this is not an entirely new phenomenon. Osama bin Laden is who we're worried about today because Al Qaeda has both issued what he claims to be a fatwa saying that it is the responsibility of Muslims around the world to get nuclear weapons to use them against the United States. But before Osama bin Laden, the Aum Shinrikyo, the cult in Japan that believed that an apocalypse would coming and that they would be able to survive it, wanted to encourage the apocalypse by getting nuclear weapons so they penetrated the Russian security system trying to get weapons from the Soviet Union and then Russia. 
They were unsuccessful. They tried to get biological weapons. They were unsuccessful, so they settled for the sarin gas, which they used in the Tokyo subways in the 90s. Before that, the Bader Meinhof gang, a German leftist group, and the Red Brigades tried to steal U.S. nuclear weapons from bases in NATO Europe, North Atlantic Treaty Organization Europe. A more likely but less hazardous threat, that is, something that is easier to get than a weapon <coughs> and easier to make than a gun-type weapon out of highly enriched uranium, would be a dirty bomb. To explode various kinds of nuclear materials, it would not kill a whole lot of people. It would kill some. It would create environmental hazards. And this, too, is being explored. James Cummings is a neo-Nazi from Belfast, Maine, was discovered uh, to have acquired some primitive dirty bomb materials when his wife, who had been subject to sexual abuse for many years, killed him, called the police, and they found hate letters to President Obama, President-elect Obama at the time, uh, and uh, literature on dirty bombs and materials uh, in his garage. He was an amateur, was not going to be very effective, but had a trust fund and lots of money and was on his way to try to develop a dirty bomb. Dhiran Borat was a uh, Pakistani, uh, Indian-born Muslim trained in Pakistan who wrote a, was caught by the British police writing a research paper on dirty bombs for Al-Qaeda Central. He's in prison now. They have declassified part of his term paper. He looked at the kinds of things that Dartmouth students would look at if trying to understand dirty bombs, did the research on American and British scholarship, had forged a pass into the University of London library system, uh, reported on different kinds of radioactive isotopes, uh, what, who would be affected in terms of, of long-term cancer deaths. Uh, another page from his research paper uh, noted that uh, we had uh, somebody who had access to, this, to some nuclear materials, but he was captured, he was arrested, security's tight, and he recommended in his summary uh, that 10,000 smoke detectors be purchased, because there's a bit, small bit of uh, americium in some smoke detectors. If you put 10,000 of them together and could be, do this by having 10 different people buy, buy them covertly, put them together, disperse them in a fire, thought reported it would cost some 70,000 pounds, um, and then if you were able to disperse them in fire, it would be about 500 long-term uh, uh, increased cancer deaths over time, if dispersed in a busy area, inshallah, God willing. So we know that terrorists are interested. We know that they have also had attacks against nuclear uh, sabotage attacks against nuclear facilities. Going back as far as 1972, again, this is not just an Islamic terrorist problem by any means. Here are three criminals, including one who uh, had worked at the Oak Ridge facility, who in 1972 hijacked a plane and threatened to take it into one of the reactor facilities at the Oak Ridge, Tennessee facility, creating what would have been a large-scale dirty bomb. Uh, effect. We were given $2 million uh, by the Nixon administration, flew to Cuba, where Castro, in a very rare moment of international cooperation, arrested uh, the individuals. Again, sabotage is a serious problem as well. What can be done? And this is the other hidden aspect of the administration's strategy, which I think is actually very wise and poorly understood. Last month, President Obama, for the first time since the UN was founded, invited 40-some heads of state to Washington. This was ridiculed in some of the press by saying, oh, that nothing much happened. Having this huge summit, and all that happened was that Mexico, Canada, and Ukraine agreed to turn back highly enriched uranium to downblend it, to get rid of it more quickly, and everybody agreed that we're going to get rid of highly enriched uranium, which is more easily used for bombs out of our research reactors. The real benefit of this was that there are 44 heads of state now who have to start paying attention to security of their nuclear power facilities. Moreover, they have to report back two years now, from two years from now, when there will be a second nuclear security summit in Seoul, hosted by the South Korean government, 
And the best way to get a state to pay attention is to have the head of state say, I want reports on how well we're doing. Have we locked everything up? Have we gotten rid of our highly enriched uranium? Do we have adequate security? The worrisome side is that they said the responsibility to do that is for each state and there are no international standards. And the best things we can do, I think, here are to improve security programs by having new standards for what are the minimum threat that each country should be able to defend against. The design basis threat is a methodology developed by the Sandia National Laboratory uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico that says you should have independent intelligence agencies decide what is the threat, how serious, what kinds of arms do terrorists have, how many should you protect against, and design and practice in exercises protection against that threat. The IAEA agrees with that methodology. A number of countries have said they'll follow that methodology. But to give you one example where it's faulty, the Japanese have at the vast majority of their nuclear power plants no armed guards. And they say, we're following this methodology because we believe there are no armed threats against those facilities. We need to have minimum standards adopted around the world. People in the nuclear power industry, in enrichment facilities or reprocessing facilities are reluctant for understandable reasons to publish all their security plans lest they fall into the wrong hands. So there's a new organization called WINS, the World Institute of Nuclear Security, uh, begun uh, uh, a year and a half ago. It's had its first meetings where privately with academics like me and the operators of facilities meet privately to talk about what are the best practices? What are mistakes that you've made that you've learned from? And let's share with each other, not publishing the, the work, but let's share with each other how we can get better at doing this. A really interesting institutional innovation. Bismarck, the great uh, chancellor in the Uniter of Germany once said that only a fool learns from his mistakes. Wise people learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> and this institute is dedicated to that. And lastly, one last acronym, all states should have personnel reliability programs for people involved in handling critical nuclear materials, whether they're in power plants or in weapons programs. And they shouldn't just have psychological testing and the maintenance of security checks, they should assume that that's not going to work 100% of the time. And therefore, they have to have an insider threat in their standards so that no one insider can steal materials. You have to have two men rules, you have to have fences, you have to have checks so that in addition to having psychological testing and checking to make sure that people aren't affiliated with terrorist organizations, you should assume that that's not going to work 100% of the time and design your systems to include insider threats as one thing to protect against. The biggest problem here, I think, is that some people in some developing countries think this is not our problem. That's your problem in the United States or in Western Europe. It's your foreign policies and your actions at home that make you a target of terrorist threats. And I think the best counter to that argument was Kofi Annan, who said, regardless of where a terrorist incident occurs, if it's large scale, which any nuclear power plant sabotage or any nuclear terrorist dirty bomb of a large scale or a weapon so it would certainly be, it's going to have a second wave of effects around the world. Indeed, it may well be that more people died in Africa after 9-11 because of the secondary economic consequences that went around the world than died in New York and Washington. And Kofi Annan's reminding other non-nuclear weapon states, other developing world countries that we're in this together and we have to combat this problem together. So I'll conclude here with just this final note on what the strategy of the administration is. Is to say, we're going to work in good faith towards eventual disarmament. We don't know, as President Obama said, whether this can occur in his lifetime, but we're pledged to do that. We're going to have to improve on verification. We're going to have to try to figure out how to deal with stability at low numbers. But we signed the agreement and we're going to take good faith efforts to work at least in that direction. And in exchange, he believes that that's necessary 
to get the non-nuclear weapon states to say, okay, we'll keep our side of the bargain and have more constraints on our nuclear power, to sign the additional protocol, to sign uh, uh, a return to sender clauses in the future, because we have a more fair sharing of responsibilities. Disarmament constraining us, nuclear power constraints constraining them. And whether or not you think that nuclear power is a good thing, we have to acknowledge that it's going to happen in many countries, whether we like it or not. And therefore, even if you don't want, say, the United Arab Emirates to get nuclear power, they're doing it. And once they do it, we want them to do it well. We want them to be successful, to be safe and secure, and the kinds of measures that I'm uh, suggesting could help in that regard. Are these facts that there's a linkage in this way? I'd say this is more of a grand experiment to see whether our disarmament efforts, if done more fulsomely, more credibly, and in good faith, can get other countries to do similar kinds of cooperative actions so that we can have a spread of nuclear power in a more safe and secure manner. I'll conclude there and I'm looking forward to questions and comments. So I'll just call on people and it would help me if you'd identify yourself. If you're a student, tell me what your major or what you're thinking about doing. If you're a, a, a local citizen or a faculty member, tell me about who you are. It would just help me and help the rest of the audience. So please, who's got the first question or comment? Yes. Scott. Wait, wait for the. Scott Drysdale, computer science. Yes. Okay. Um, my biggest concern has been your scenario with North Korea, that people follow the rules, they get all the materials, right. uh, then they suddenly say, oh, in three months we're pulling out, and in six months they have a bomb. Right. Uh, they build up all the infrastructure, they train all their scientists, they do all that stuff under the legal system. Correct. Do you think that return to sender clauses would actually allow you to do something in that case, once uh, you've got the material? A return to sender clause, if it is done prospectively, which is what the nuclear suppliers group could do, could prevent future North Koreas or could reduce the likelihood by both being a deterrent, saying if you do that, it's illegal, um, and could therefore shape their environment so that they'd be a little bit less likely to do it. It doesn't stop them from doing it, and so therefore you have to have some kind of, of, of international condemnation and real effects. So the other part of this has been President Obama saying that people who break rules have to pay consequences. So it is no accident, I should say, that the NPT Review Conference is occurring simultaneously in the General Assembly facilities while the UN Security Council is debating and coming to close to having a vote on having improved sanctions or increased sanctions on Iran for breaking their side to this. So um, I think enforcement still has to, to take place. Indeed, uh, there's lots of interesting work that, that Daryl and others in political science are more aware of about enforcement mechanisms. And my own belief is that a world without nuclear weapons is not going to be a, an entirely peaceful world. Indeed, it will be a world in which countries that do not want to see another country get nuclear weapons will occasionally have to enforce disarmament uh, by uh, more vigorous acts than what happened with North Korea, which not nearly enough happened. Yes, Madam. Meredith Angwin, and, oh. and I am uh, used to work at the Electric Power Research Institute. I have two quick questions. The first one is, uh, could you comment on the megaton to megawatt type programs and whether they have increased security? And the second is, uh, when talking about getting rid of highly enriched uranium, there are a lot of uh, test reactors and so forth at universities. Are you proposing that those not be used anymore? I, I, I'm not clear on, on that aspect. Yeah. Um, one is, is uh, the first question deals with can you take materials out of nuclear weapons, down blend them, and use that for nuclear power? And the answer, correct? Right. 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 The megaton to megawatt. I wondered if it had increased the security of the world, in your opinion. 
Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so um, I don't have on top of my head the, the numbers now. I know for the state of Illinois, for example, over half of its nuclear power comes from former so material from former Soviet weapons. In the U.S., it's less than that, uh, but it's still very, very significant and should continue. And it's a, a very important program. It's recycling. It's it's turning. Uh, um, swords into, into plowshares, a, a very useful program. There are limits to how quickly you can do it, and not all materials can be done that way, but it's, it's a very useful um, aspect. On the HEU, um, the current administration's position, if I understand it correctly, is that um, all research reactors should move towards different forms of light, uh, uh, lightly uh, low enriched uranium, LEU rather than HEU. How far it goes into very, very small reactors, I, I don't know, but the global cleanout effort is, is designed to pick which are the greatest threats in terms of the concentration of materials and reduce that step by step. So this HEU agreement was picking those countries in part because they want, were cooperative, but in part because they had such high levels. But how far it goes down in individual uh, small test reactors, I don't know. Uh, way in the back. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm a, uh, it, I'm a freshman hoping to become a gov uh, government major. Great. Um, my question was, how do you think the building of more nuclear power plants, even ones that are a lot more advanced and complex than when they were first um, produced, how do you think that will affect the environment? Because, you know, how do you think, do they have better safety options? And yeah, they, they, they do. Um, you know, safety still has to be pushed. We have to continue working on it. Um, we cannot build the kinds of reactors that created the problem in the former Soviet Union that didn't have containment vessels, as, as you saw in Chernobyl. Um, right now, in the long term, there may be developments of, of all sorts of smaller reactors that are more inherently safe. Over the next 25 years, countries are interested in the current generation or the next generation of light water reactors, which the, the next generation will be safer. They still have the security problem because once you have, if you need light, low enriched uranium, you've got to have some place that enriches it, and that could be used for a bomb. The existing nuclear reactors will have nuclear. Uh, plutonium that's produced in the reactors, and you've got to have some place of storing it, and you have to have some place of controlling it, and that's why you need to have a fuel bank controlled by international actors and some kind of repository, or if there is reprocessing, have that controlled by an international consortium, not by individual countries. In terms of its environmental effects, it depends on how much, and it depends on what else we do. Most people who I respect on this subject say that nuclear power is one part, but only one part. And conservation is probably the biggest thing that we can do to help. But beyond conservation, we need to do research on lots of different strategies <coughs> and that each one of them has some role to play. Nuclear power has an important role to play and is going to have an impact depending on which countries develop it and how quickly they, they do so. Some people say it will be one of, uh, you should read Professor Robert Sokolow's uh, work on wedges that reduce climate change uh, mitigation. And he argues that nuclear power should be one major wedge, but he says these problems are so dangerous we need to wait for the next generation and solve these problems, and that's why we're trying to do that. But I congratulate you for a freshman coming to the, uh, an extra lecture. That's great. Right here. I'm Will. I'm a math major at Dartmouth. I was wondering, um, I've read some, a bit of literature on indices of political corruption and the fact that there's a lot of corruption in certain countries in the developing world that's not getting picked up by these indices because it has to do with um, corporations and other types of informal or illegal business that are going that are going on between country borders 
and for example you have switzerland is like a repository of dirty criminal money but is considered not corrupt on the corruption indices right. so i was wondering um uh, i noticed you mentioned corruption indices in, in your presentation but if there is a potential problem with nuclear power becoming or p potential trading of nuclear materials becoming one of these uh, illegal trades that operates between countries and that that could be a problem that's not picked up by enforcing all these types of regulations on individual states that are signing these nuclear treaties? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. Great question. Um, a, you're right that the World Bank indices don't measure things like your willingness to take uh, uh, dirty money or, or, or feared to be uh, dirty money. And that these corruption index, uh, this corruption index is, is only as good as as the inputs that, that go into it. Uh, but you're also right that that the the reason why we should be concerned is because of the linkage between corruption and selling of materials. The major case in point is the AQ Khan network out of Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Khan was a metallurgist uh, trained in the West, working at Urenco. One of the uh, few, one, it's an international consortium that enriches uranium for nuclear power plants. A Dutch, German, British consortium. He took the blueprints for the centrifuges that they used, and even more importantly, took the Rolodexes, the addresses of all the people who made all the parts that did this, fled to Pakistan, and volunteered his services and became the head of the AQ Khan uh, laboratory. Khan Research Library. That research laboratory both imported all this material with an illegal network, but we now know also exported things to other countries. Was this Khan network a case of corruption or not? Some people say this was complicity on the part of the Pakistani government, the Pakistani military wanted him to do this, traded his exports, his network connections to North Korea for missiles for the Pakistani military. Other people say that this was not, the Pakistani government was not complicit, it was just negligent. That it assumed that this national hero was doing stuff for the state, gave him a lot of leeway because he had to deal with criminals, he had to do with criminal networks. Otherwise, he couldn't have gotten the stuff from Pakistan. My own view is similar to what you're suggesting about institutional corruption that's hard to measure. I think the Pakistani state is so corrupt in so many ways that they're not even aware sometimes whether something is negligence or complicity. Case in point, President Musharraf, in his memoirs, published in the West in a way that he thinks is is a very positive story for himself, says, I was, when I was president and chief of the army staff, I was concerned about Dr. Khan. The, international, the ISI, the intelligence agency, came to me and said that you know, he's selling some stuff illegally. So I called him to my office and I said, is that true? <laughs> and Dr. Khan said, no, that's not true. That's true at all. And President Musharraf said, but I remain suspicious. <laughs> now, if you had the head of the Los Alamos laboratory be a multimillionaire and have his own foundation and have multiple houses around the country and everybody knew about it, you would do more than say, I remain suspicious. There was an institutional corruption in that country that's hard to measure but clearly had effects. So I think, yeah, I encourage you to do that research. I think it's, it's interesting and difficult work. Yeah, right here. Uh, Good evening. My name is Uti and I'm from India and I would like to uh, talk about your point. I'm a class of 2013 uh, tentative engineering major. And I'd, to, I'd like to talk to you about the point of uh, institutionalist corruption in Pakistan uh, and that really bothers me as an Indian citizen and given the dismal state of affairs in the subcontinent. Should, should bother you as a Pakistani citizen or as an American citizen, but I can understand why Indian citizens would, would be particularly exactly. concerned. 
Uh, what uh, and and you know, India and Pakistan have gone have had have gone to one th war thrice since independence, and uh, there's always a talk of war after Mumbai attacks or on that uh, attack on Indian Parliament. Uh, however, there's no talk of uh, nuclear disarmament between the two nations. Um, I'm wondering what steps would you uh, w would you uh, suggest for the Pakistani government to rein in the rogue elements in Pakistan, so ju so that these uh, these fundamentalists essentially don't get a hold of the nuclear weapons and either attack India or any part of the Western world? Um, again, good question. Um, well, there are two things that, that, that have been done and need to be continued. First is that in addition to the UN Security Council Resolution 1887 that I mentioned uh, about future sales, uh, there was another UN Security Council Resolution called 1540 that required all states to have better to have to examine and report back on their export laws and export organization regulatory agencies um, to ensure that there be no illegal smuggling of nuclear materials or nuclear technology. Now, in the UN system, the Security Council can demand that, and some countries do a lot, some countries do a little, but at least there's now a reporting system and a subunit within the UN that takes those reports and publishes them and can say, here's what you've done and here's what you haven't done. So that's helped Pakistan a little bit. Um, secondly, um, this is uh, where the NPT can be a challenge. Um, when Pakistan tested nuclear weapons in 1998, um, within a month after India had tested first, um, the U.S. government was encouraged by many specialists, myself included, to talk to the Pakistanis and the Indians about now that you're a nuclear power, what can you do to protect the materials? What can you do to protect the weapons so that a terrorist in both countries won't seize them? The U.S. government said, we can't do that. They're not members of the treaty, and this would be a violation of our Article I rights but the U.S. government did say to Stanford, to CSAC, the organization that, that Daryl mentioned, why don't you guys go talk to them? <laughs> so I led a team that went into Islamabad and Rawalpindi and also did something similar in, in New Delhi and said, here's how the personnel reliability program works in the United States. We brought American doctors who were involved in setting up that program. We brought specialists on Russian command and control and say, here's how they have better guard facilities and the challenges that they're facing. We brought in specialists on American, uh, the design basis threat methodology, et cetera. And indeed, on September 11, 2001, uh, I was in Washington getting ready to brief at the National Security Council staff uh, about what we have done, what other private scholars have done, and to urge the U.S. government to take it over, saying, we can only say what's in the unclassified literature. We can only do this as private citizens. And the Pakistanis were very, very interested. After 9-11, the U.S. government switched its position. The details are all kept classified. David Sanger, in his book, The Inheritance, Sanger, the New York Times reporter, wrote a book. I urge you to read it. He reports in this that the U.S. government has spent $100 million of aid to the Pakistani military to help them have better techniques to protect their nuclear weapons. That's the good news, if it's right. The bad news is that the Pakistanis won't let us in to see how they've used it <laughs> because they're concerned that we, if we know where their stuff is, we might attack it or try to seize it someday. So it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, but I think um, you know, both with India and Pakistan, there's a lot that can be done. And the World Institute for Nuclear Security does not deal with nuclear weapons. It deals with nuclear power. But some of the lessons learned about how to improve your systems uh, uh, can be done uh, for, th there's, there's an overlap between what you want to do in both areas. Yeah, the individual right here in the blue shirt. I'm Pete Lothus, a retired engineer that lives in the area. Uh, I had thought, and perhaps my understanding is incorrect, but I had thought that during the previous administration, a program was begun to try to form a multinational consortium to both supply the nuclear fuel and to reprocess it, process it right. in a centralized sort of non-threatening organization that would keep the aspirant companies from, um, from having to deal with either right. the incoming or the outgoing fuel. And then I further thought that in the new administration that program was canceled. 
Right. Uh, is my understanding correct? Is it a good idea, a bad idea? What, what are your thoughts? Depends on the details of it. Um, I think what we're referring to is the GNEP, the Global Nuclear Energy Program, uh, that was developed to try to establish what kinds of mechanisms could you have. Um, the first thing that the Bush administration did that I thought was not helpful was to say that when we put this plan together, the first goal should be no new countries get uranium enrichment, ever. And what that meant for a number of the developing countries was you have a monopoly, you're not going to share the profits with us. Moreover, what it meant was for a couple countries, oh boy, this uh, door is closing, we better get in really quickly. So the minute the Bush announced that as the objective, the Australians, a number of countries, the Mongolians, start saying, well, we want to get into the enrichment business as well. So the new administration is saying, look, we don't want to have the spread of nuclear enrichment around the world, but we recognize that you have a right to do that, and we want to figure out some international mechanism rather than having a monopoly. On the back end, this current administration has not decided what they want to do about reprocessing. And the idea is there is you have two options. You could either keep the spent fuel, keep the plutonium in it, and have it put into repositories, or to reprocess it and use the plutonium in MOX fuel for recycle for another reactor, right? They haven't actually, as far as I know, come up with what their international scheme will be on how to manage that. So they're exploring the idea of having international repositories. What if we build in Mongolia or add to the Finnish repository or get our act together here and find a new, better Yucca Mountain to have a repository where we could take the material and not reprocess it? That's one option. The other option is to have international control of reprocessing. And the administration, as far as I know, uh, Dr. Chu has not yet announced what the, the global scheme will be, but there'll be something like the GNEP, but its details have not been fully formed yet. Uh, student over here. Uh, I'm Trevor Chenoweth. I'm a government major. I'm also a member of the policy debate team. Our topic for this last year was actually on nuclear weapons policy of the United States. Uh, Did you debate question, the no first use uh, thing back and forth? Uh, we debated no first use a couple times, yeah. Good. Um, I think our, our argument was about tactical nuclear weapons, a little bit different. But uh, I, My question was about the graph of governance scores, the blue and red uh, chart. Sure. Whether that's the total kind of sum of scores for, for nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. And uh, following up to that, if that's true, uh, why are we concerned about those states that are just aspiring nuclear power states that might have governance scores that are higher than some of the ones in the blue category that are already existing nuclear weapon states? Um, we're not. Uh, this, is, this is trying to represent averages in one chart. And you could get the score for each country. It would be a pretty ugly chart, but it would show all of them. And you could make part of your judgments about who gets nuclear power based on these scores. I'm here just trying to represent what the, the challenge would be. So clearly there are some countries on both this and on the terrorism score that are in the aspiring category that are high and some that are low. I'm just trying to present the, the global challenge here. Um, you, know, you could say, well, I don't want to have nuclear power in these countries. I won't support it. Politically, I think that's really hard. So instead what you have to do is establish rules that could include measures of, of this sort and make judgments about who you want to sell to. Uh, but that's done in a competitive marketplace, unfortunately, where different governments and different companies want to make the money. So the nuclear suppliers group is this critical dimension of the solution here of having meetings of the people together and say, should we sell to this country or not? And it can't be done on an individual country basis politically. It's hard to do that. So using those scores would be helpful, but there has to be some rule-based mechanism to get all countries to agree. And that's why something I would think, for example, by saying minimally you have to agree to the additional protocol. You have to agree to have inspections everywhere in your country, otherwise we won't sell it. Or you have to agree to the return to sender. I think politically that's a more acceptable, more likely, more fair, equitable system than saying, you, Turkey, can't get it, while you, Egypt, can, or, or the other way around. 
Right here. Uh, hi, my name is Bob Siviak, and I'm a consultant to several citizens groups on uh, U.S. nuclear weapons development programs. Right. And my question is, uh, is not in the lifetime of a healthy 45-year-old American president uh, sufficient commitment to Article 6 to get the kinds of international cooperation that you talk about for uh, control of proliferation? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we are going to find out over the next three weeks. My own view would be that there will be some countries whose governments will say, what you're doing is great, we'll accept some constraints. There are others that will say, wait until you ratify the CTBT. Once you ratify the test ban, we'll do it. And there are others who will say, hey, you've got a long life in front of you, you're not really taking this seriously yet. What we don't know is the degree to which those views, when someone says uh, in a non-nuclear weapon state, I'm not going to agree to have in increased inspections until you get really serious about disarmament, is that a rhetorical cover to permit them to do things that get them closer to the bomb because they secretly want the bomb? Or is that, to use a technical political science term, is that because they're pissed off at the United States? I think in some cases it's frankly that they're pissed off. They say that you guys haven't done enough. You said you'd do one thing, and then you didn't do it. So I think minimally, we should ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I think that's in our national security interests, but I think it also has this extra benefit of this. There still will be some countries for whom that's a rhetorical cover. But I think each country that agrees to the additional protocol, and if you make it and incentivize them, not just to complain about us, but actually say, look, you can get nuclear power more effectively, more quickly, if you abide by these rules than if you don't, that could help as well. And we're going to find out in the next couple of weeks how well this grand experiment works. My guess is that we'll see some success stories over the next year, uh, but there'll still be some challenges. Scott, why don't I suggest you take one more question? Okay, one last question here and out in front. Hi, I'm Jennifer Armstrong. I'm a freshman, so I'm an undeclared major, but um, I'm also a member of the policy debate team. Um, I was wondering if you thought that suggestions to incorporate non-NPT members into additional protocols or other IAEA safeguards um, while still maintaining their non-member status were viable, or if you thought that these would undermine the NPT's credibility. Um, I think that everything we can do to make the non-members have safer, and more secure nuclear power is in our interests. I think it's very hard to do that through the official um, NPT mechanism. For example, they can't attend as members to the review conference. But India, Israel, and Pakistan are all members of the International Atomic Energy Agency. They are subject to safeguards for any facility that they have agreed to have safeguarded. So under the new India-U.S. deal, it's really better thought of as a nuclear suppliers group India deal. Any new facilities that they build for civilian purposes will be under safeguards. And I think that's a, a good thing. Uh, I hope that if China cuts a deal with Pakistan, as they suggest they're going to do, I hope they don't do it, but if they do, I hope they put those facilities under IAEA safeguards so they're not used uh, for weapons. Israel today does not have a nuclear a nuclear power program. Uh, it has the one re reactor that they've used for the nuclear weapons program. If they develop nuclear power, yeah, I do think they should have it fully safeguarded, and it should be as safe and secure as we can make it. Hey, Scott, this was um, absolutely terrific as we knew it would be. Thank you so much. And in a way, you've given us a scorecard or at least a you know, framework to understand what's going to happen in the next few days, next few weeks at the, uh, at the NPT Review Commission. So thank you so much for this. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for all the great questions. Thanks.